Corsets to crinoline, unmentionables in the road to women's suffrage. The undergarments worn by women in the Victorian era were harmful and practical and limited the quality of life for women. Why then did women submit to wearing tightly fitted corsets and layers upon layers of heavy clothing? The purpose of women's undergarments in the Victorian era were to sculpt a woman's figure into the desired shape of their prospective bow. A tiny waist was desired by Victorian men as well as a voluminous backside, as seen in the bustle era. Upper class and middle class Victorian women lived in an era in which they were required to stay in the home and could not work for a living. Therefore, a good marriage was vital to ensure their livelihood. This caused women's persistence to cultivate and maintain a desirable appearance to charm the opposite sex. This exhibit seeks to understand the changes in society that caused women's fashion to evolve. The rejection of tightly fitted corsets and impractical large dresses signifies women's rejection of solely existing within the confines of the household. At the turn of the 20th century, we see a drastic change in what women wore and the activities that they participated in and echoed this change. Through the lens of women's undergarments, this exhibit explores how fashion mirrored the women's liberation movement and social reform. The more women took part in activities outside of the home in sports, activism, travel, exploration, and politics, the less restrictive their undergarments became. The Feminine Silhouette from 1750 to 1925. This timeline shows how women's fashion changed from 1750 to 1925. Pay close attention to the style of dress and its accompanying silhouette. The natural shape of a woman's body is rejected and then transformed by undergarments of the figure. Such tools to achieve these looks included corsets, petticoats, crinolines, bustles, drawers, and other supporting devices. The Death of the Dress Reform Movement, Bloomerism. Quote, I can see no business avocation in which women in her present dress can possibly earn equal wages with man. End quote. By Susan B. Anthony. The dress reform movement officially began in 1851 when radical Victorian women began incorporating the bloomer, or the first rendition of women's trousers, into their wardrobes. Many people, including physicians, educators, and activists, were opposed to the restrictive clothing that were popular at the time. Many touted claims that fashionable dress was causing sickness and death, as well as making women unable to perform normal housework and bear healthy children. While many complaints centered on the long skirts, overly ornate design, and the restricting corset, the first of these to be reformed were the long skirts that collected unsanitary materials at the bottom and made physical activity different. The Bloomer costume originated with Elizabeth Smith Miller, daughter of Garrett Smith, a leading American social reformer in women's dress reform, temperance, abolition of slavery, and many other causes. His daughter Elizabeth started the practice of wearing the Bloomer costume, a term coined for the full Turkish trousers gathered at the ankles and a short overskirt coming just above the knees. Miller stated that in the spring of 1851, she became so thoroughly disgusted with her long skirt after working in her garden that she made the change to wear something more practical. This costume was popularized by Amelia Bloomer, lending her name to the garment in her temperance magazine, The Lily. And it also became the adopted dress of most women rights leaders. Middle proponents of the Bloomers include Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Paulina Wright Davis, Lucy Stone, and Sarah and Angelina Grip Grimke. The reactions of this new dress were stark and polarizing. Many believed that this costume would not be acceptable in public. Newspapers claimed that the women's dress should be reformed, but the bloomer costumes were simply ugly. Some declared that outfits such as these were only adopted by homely women to appear more attractive. Conservative men and women were outraged that women had lost their mystery and attractiveness by discarding their dresses and therefore desexing themselves in a way that would be catastrophic for the American family. Some believe that this was an effort by women to become more like men rather than embracing their own femininity. 
Some went as far as to say that only women with the desire to entice men would wear such scandalous apparel that showcased their legs. In the end, bloomerism did not survive the 1850s. The spectacle that these women created by going out in public in this scandalous attire did nothing to promote their ideology and to increase the rights of women. It distracted from their original purpose and was so heavily ridiculed that it embarrassed the wearer and took away her ability to be taken seriously. As Lucy Stone stated in February of 1894, quote, But useful as the bloomer was, the ridicule of the world killed it. It suffered the usual fate of anything that is 40 years ahead of its time, end quote. While dress reform was still discussed and debated throughout the rest of the century, no costume was introduced afterward. More simplified underclothes grew to popularity, as well as combinations, which used drawers and the chemise to reduce the number of undergarments worn underneath clothing. A prophecy was made by the Women's Journal in 1870 that reform dress is, quote, dependent upon and must come after suffrage, end quote. It is often argued that improved clothes for women played no part in feminine emancipation, but that emancipation itself had brought about greater dress reform than any of the earliest feminists would have advocated for. The Legacy of the Bloomer In the 1890s, the Bloomer was revisited as an aid for women to wear while exercising. In the 1893 Women's Congress of the World's Columbian Exposition, they introduced a session of health benefits of the Bloomer that allowed for women to have more mobility. Lucy Stone spoke at this event about her time wearing the costume in the 1850s and stated that it was, quote, the cleanest, neatest, and most comfortable and sensible garment she had ever worn, end quote. In 1894, Annie Londonderry Kupchowski popularized the bloomer even more by donning it during her famous bicycle trip around the world, becoming the first woman to do so. Soon, an updated version of the bloomer became the standard dress for bicycling for women during the biking craze of the 1890s. This craze was instrumental in providing women with an independent method of transportation and revolutionizing women's clothing to allow for more freedom. In the late 19th and early 20th century, they witnessed the birth of an athletic bloomer, formerly called the Rational or Knickerbocker. These were skirtless, baggy, knee-length trousers fastened to the leg a little below the knee and always worn with stockings to cover the legs. While the bloomer costume did not survive the 1850s, it paved the way 40 years later to be reinvented with a sporty look that gave women more autonomy. The sense of freedom led to more women exercising their right to travel, exploring, and eventually driving automobiles. The Cage Crinoline, lightweight, cheap, and deadly, the 1850s brought about another revolutionary item that changed women's fashion not only for the upper class, but also for women across all other classes. The sprung steel hoop skirt, or the cage crinoline, was introduced in 1856 and was produced at a massive scale. The 1850s and 60s brought about fashion of a more cinched in waist that was achieved by creating bigger and more exaggerated skirts, as well as the tightening of the corsets. Before the invention, various underskirts, petticoats, flounces, and stiffened skirts predated the cage crinoline to achieve a fuller skirt. These were replaced with a bell-shaped series of horizontal, concentric hoops hanging by the waist and held together by vertical bands of tape. Its material could include horsehair, iron, wood, or steel. The cage crinoline hung from the hips at, over various petticoats and could reach a lower circumference of up to five yards. Due to the mechanized production of this new undergarment, women of all classes could afford them, unlike the farthingales and paneers worn a century prior that could only be afforded by the wealthy. Many ladies of the home did not like the cross-contamination of their maids dressing as they did, and by 1875, George Routledge had published an article in his etiquette manual criticizing London housemaids for wearing hoops that work. He stated that these hoops could be so easily raised that they exposed the lower bodies of working women when they kneeled. He also thought that working women should leave their more fashionable clothing for leisurely periods at home. Crotchless drawers, a crinoline creation. The cage crinoline was heavily criticized as unsuitable for women of all classes. Feminists and dress reformers believed that these massive items made women unable to perform simple duties and simply encased them further. 
Many newspapers published gaffes and cartoons noting the flimsy nature of the crinoline and how it could often fly up in the wind and expose the ladies' underclothes. It was this reason that further underclothes were needed to remain modest, hence the popularity of ladies' drawers. Before the lightweight option of crinoline, it would require a lot of force to lift a woman's heavy layers of petticoats and skirts. Therefore, it seemed unnecessary for women to wear any version of what we consider underwear today. Drawers were the first version of modern underwear to become widely popular. Open crotch drawers were preferred for easier access to the bathroom. Children wore, wore closed drawers or pantalettes before this time as they had a higher possibility of being exposed during player physical activities. Although many working class women were instructed to leave their hoops at home, many still chose to keep with the fashion until the bustle era in the 1870s. There were several recorded incidents of servants and factory workers being harmed or killed by crinolines. The flammability of the crinoline was widely reported. It is estimated in the 1850s and 60s that about 3,000 women died in crinoline-related fires. One such incident is the death of 14-year-old kitchen maid Margaret Davy. It was reported in the Times on February 13, 1863. Her dress, quote, distended by a crinoline, end quote, caught fire as she stood next to the fireplace to reach some spoons on the mantelpiece. She died as a result of extensive burns. A report in the Cork Examiner of June 2nd, 1864, recorded the death of Anne Rowlandson from injuries sustained after her crinoline was caught in a revolving machinery shaft in the mangling room at a bleaching facility. The Victorian corset. The corset, much like the crinoline, saw a technological advance that made its construction easier and cheaper for the masses. In 1828, the metal eyelet was invented, and this allowed for the corset to become drastically tightened for the first time. Corsets also became cheaper and were worn by all classes of women, while prior to the Victorian era, they were exclusively afforded only by the very wealthy. Made pri primarily of whalebone, steel, fine material, and wood, the corset evolved into a number of nuanced shapes for centuries, mirroring the ideal body type preferred in each era, though an overall hourglass shape prevails for much of its history. Corseting became an important signifier of fashionableness in upper and middle class society, becoming a hallmark of virtue of Victorian women according to social historian Bernard Rudofsky, who also suggested that an uncorseted woman reeked of license. An unlaced waist was regarded as a vessel of sin. While quite popular with the majority of women, warnings against corsets from the medical, fashion, and advice literature were proliferated in this period. It was said that prolonged usage could produce dire consequences to the human body. By unnaturally compressing the waist, especially of growing women, ribs were pressed so tightly that in extreme cases they overlapped. The lungs could not take in sufficient air to purify the system. The vital organs lack adequate room to develop fully and become cramped or displaced. The stomach and the bowels might be rearranged or the womb pushed far into the lower abdomen, causing a prolapsed uteri, a painful malady prevent While the corset was just one of several harmful pieces of clothing, it is perhaps known as the most dangerous. However, many dress reformers did not call for corsets to disappear entirely. They simply requested that they not be so tightly tied. There were radical believers that also voiced opinions that women's clothing was the result of a male conspiracy to make subservient women by cultivating within them a slave psychology. Feminine apparel was designed to consciously hamper women's movements and thus prevent them from earning living wages except through marriage. If stress reform were achieved, women could earn their wages and would not be forced to marry for economic purposes. They could have the freedom to choose their partners according to the traits they desired in the fathers of their children and as partners. Both men and women argued for decades against the use of corsets. In 1882, James Reed Chadwick, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Diocletian Lewis authored a paper titled The Health of American Women that sought to dispel the myth that women's bodies were naturally weak. Chadwick argued that climate, diet, and education have dramatic effects on the fertility of women. Stanton argued that the social norm of binding a woman to the home stifled her creativity and spirit. 
and Lewis argued that the corset, long skirts, excess fabrics, and lack of exercise predisposed women to horrible health conditions. Quote, there is a popular notion that the ill health of our women is natural, that they are victims of functions whose exercise constitutes a sort of invalidism. A woman in her natural state is a healthy, vital being, and with the removal of the corset and the long, heavy skirts and the use of those exercises where a short and very loose dress renders easy, a remarkable change ensues. The corset reduces the waist from 3 to 15 inches and pushes the organs within and downward. Then, to end this tragedy with a farce, people put on a serious face and wonder why women suffer from prolapsed uteri. This high civilization is curious. End quote from Diocletian Lewis, 1882 North American Review on the Health of American Women. While these concerns were shared by many doctors and educators, they mostly fell on deaf ears. Women were not keen on the idea of being rid of the corset. Perhaps it was even painful to halt wearing this undergarment for women whose bodies had been trained to wear them for decades. The muscles in their bodies had atrophied, and it became more comfortable to wear a corset than to go without one. Corsets were marketed as healthy for the female form, with predatory advertisers suggesting corseting starting as young as 18 months old. The death of the corset. The 20th century brought about both technological advances and social reform that transformed women's dress. By 1900, women were increasingly leaving the household to participate in sports, education, philanthropic opportunities, and work, causing women to seek more comfortable clothing. The Edwardian era of 1901 to 1910 brought about a new style of corset that extended past the waist, down the thighs, to straighten the front body, and to create the S-curve silhouette. While the style of corset was very popular, the notion that corsets had to be worn at all times was slowly diminishing. Women began wearing tea gowns and lightweight dresses, usually only worn inside the house and out into the public sphere. Tight corseting became less common as women participated in political marches, sporting activities, and travel. The style of exterior clothing became increasingly more feminine with frilly and lacy dresses becoming more popular. In 1913, 5,000 women came to Washington, D.C. to march for women's suffrage at the Women's Suffrage Procession, the day before President Wilson's inauguration. Women's right to education and emancipation were broadly argued for across the United States, mirrored by changes in attire and underwear. Many feminists chose to wear white as a symbol of purity and opted for less constraining corsets. By the late 1910s, corsets no longer constricted the waist but worked to smooth the body. Dresses were flowy and looser fitting rather than precisely fitted to the corseted figure. Hemlines were rising to show the ankles for the first time. Daytime dresses were becoming elbow length and showing the collarbone. Designs like the hobble skirt briefly rose as a fad that again hampered women's movement by making skirts tapered at the tight ankles. Women's rights activists shied from any fashion that thwarted women's autonomy, thus emancipating women from dress constraints while advocating for social and political reforms. In 1914, the corset saw its first big blow, the Great War. The steel used in corsetry was needed by the war effort, and by 1917, the U.S. War Industries Board issued a plea for women to stop purchasing corsets. Women instead turned to to the brassiere, invented in 1913 by Mary Phelps Jacob. While versions of the bra were being produced in France, the brassiere as we know it was designed by Miss Jacob after becoming fed up with the thickness of her corset that made dancing uncomfortable and showed the lines on the exterior of her ball gown. Corsets had created a mono-bosom effect for centuries, 
but the bra lifted and separated the breast for more comfort and freedom of movement. After World War I, the corset would come back into fashion but had evolved completely away from the Victorian corset. Women often did not return to restrictive corseting after knowing social and economic mobility. Women's fashion in the 1920s is a rebuttal of the fashion of their mothers and a move to a much shorter hemline, exposed limbs, and a boyish and straight silhouette that was perceived as a rejection of femininity. Ladies wore an underbust corset with a bosom flattening brassiere that sought to hide the hips, breasts, and waist in favor of a straight figure. By the end of the 1920s, corsetry overwent a huge change as new fabrics and materials were used to create undergarments, such as latex, elastic, and rubber. Sheepwear called a foundation emerged, integrating the corset with elastic and removing the whalebone and stiff fabrics. Quote, out went the whalebone, in went elastic, the foundation garment or costume foundation had definitely supplanted the word corset and earned universal approval. End quote. Editorial in the Delineator, March 1929. Modern fashion and the workforce of the nation. In the 1930s, the birth of film inspired the dress of women across the country and abroad. Menswear suits were popularized by Coco Chanel and worn by actresses like Katherine Hepburn and Marlene Dietrich. The sleek and tight dresses worn by Hollywood's elite like Betty Davis and Carol Lombard, both still sporting the short bob hairstyles of the 20s, highlighted women's autonomy of dress and the onset of self-realized, sexualized dress. The girdle rose in popularity to achieve these sleek figures. Girdles replaced the foundations of the 20s as slim-fitting, stretchy step-ins that smoothed the female form but did not seek to alter it as the Titan corset did. World War II put more women in the workforce than ever. The trouser pant became increasingly popular as well as the relaxed fit blousers and the midi length skirt suits with a menswear jacket. Women's fashion became increasingly utilitarian to account for their use in the public sphere. Underwear shrunk and accounted for this entrance, becoming increasingly less restrictive until they were forced back into the home. The 1950s housewife endured yet again restrictive underwear, including the resurgence of the modern crinoline cage, as women fought to seek social changes that would come in the next decade. To see how undergarments rapidly changed from the 1860s to the 1960s, note the timeline displayed in this room that visualizes how women dressed in the world around them. While war affected how women dressed, there is a correlation between changing fashions and social reform. There was a massive rebuttal of femininity in the 1920s after passing of the 19th Amendment. Women's fashion reverted back to a restricted silhouette upon ladies' return to the home in the 1950s. The second wave of feminism in the 1960s brought true legislative changes in women's rights and true freedom for women to dress as they saw fit. Perhaps the Women's Journal prophecy of 1870 was correct, that true reformed dress for women could only come after the fight for suffrage was won. Men's undergarments. The undergarments of Victorian men generally consisted of long or short cotton or wool drawers, not unlike the drawers that ladies wore, and a long undershirt with long sleeves, typically made out of cotton, calico, linen, silk, or flannel. 
The combination of these pieces called union suits became very popular. But it wasn't until World War II that boxer shorts took off, challenging its predecessor, the tidy whities These undergarments changed underwear forever with the invention in 1934 by Arthur Niebler, an executive designer at the Wisconsin hosiery company named Coopers, received a postcard from a friend who was visiting the French Riviera. The postcard depicted a man in a bikini-style bathing suit, inspiring him to create a new, snug, legless type of underwear that he called jockey shorts. This was popular as well because of the new stretchy fabrics of the 20th century, such as rayon, nylon, and jersey knit. In our collection, we have many pairs of flannel long johns used to keep the body warm. In the early Victorian era, being cold was believed to be harmful to the body, hence the heat created by a surplus of clothing was used to ensure uniform body temperature for both men and women. In theory, a sudden cold wind or drop in temperature was sufficient to force the blood vessels beneath unclosed body parts to constrict. Physicians had long believed that a prominent source of disease arose from an overabundance of blood to the vital organs, hence the use of leeches and lancets to remove blood for centuries prior. Fortunately, by the late Victorian era, this way of thinking was starting to dissipate, though it explains why the Victorians overly dressed themselves, even in hotter climates and summer months. Corset waist. Rather than a corset, Victorian children, both boys and girls, wore a lightly corded waist. A waist looked remarkably similar to a corset, but it was made out of softer materials such as cotton or jean. The emphasis of a small waist was not the purpose of a children's corset waist, however. Its primary object was to enforce a straight symmetrical posture and to shift the pressure and weight of the drawers and petticoats away from the waist and abdomen to the shoulders. This was accomplished by shoulder straps and a double row of buttons placed strategically below the waist, upon which the corresponding buttonholes on underclothing were attached. Between the ages of four and seven, girls graduated to a more substantial corset supplied with multiple rows of stiff vertical cording. Front buttoning corsets now contain the all-important back laces to become the crucial task of molding the waist. Many caution that these need not be especially tight as this age, even the slightest pressure could hinder any growth. While fortunate children continued to wear these modified corsets until their 16th birthday, most graduated at the tender age of 12 into adult style corsets, partially or fully boned with baleen or steel, though most did retain their beneficial shoulder straps. Young boys also wore these corset waists until age five or six, starting as early as 18 months old. This practice was exclusively used by only the very wealthy in the early part of the 19th century, but by 1900, there were still many companies advertising corset waists for young girls, touting their medical benefits as late as the 1920s at cheaper costs that the middle-class families could then afford and use. <laughs> 